Today's message, I have I've titled today's message, Sons and Heirs of God. Sons and Heirs of God. So Paul made a statement that we're going to read here in Romans, Romans chapter 8, concerning that very statement. That we are sons, and if we're sons, we're heirs, and therefore heirs of what? And so that's what I'm going to answer to, uh, this morning, today. So, today, well, as throughout any period in history, there are many, many distractions that vie for our attention. And that's true. It's always been true. But I think it's more true today than it has been throughout any period in history. And for obvious reasons. We have a, we have a, a civilization that's centered around entertainment. And we have devices that we carry with us that are there to entertain us around the clock. And it's easy to get to where you become an animal that's dependent upon entertainment. If it's from your iPhone or from your television, your iPad, whatever it is, it's a horrible distraction that I can say prior generations did not have to deal with. Not that prior generations did not have distractions. There's always been distractions from Cain and Abel to now, from Adam and Eve to now. There's been distractions. But I think, again, like I said just now, we are much more inundated with distractions today than ever before. And not as if they're without our iPhones, without our, our devices, not as if there are not enough things to distract us. What are some of the things that, that are there to distract us? Our, yes, but our careers. What about our careers? Can that be a distraction? You say, wait a minute. We all need careers. We all need to produce. We all need, we all need to work on our careers. Yes, that's absolutely true. But your career can become, easily become, a great distraction. Something that vies for too much of your attention. And as men, sometimes we feel like that's an area where we have to just step up and press in as hard as we could. And that's true, but we should not allow our career to interfere with our devotion to God and our commitment to his kingdom. Is there a balance there? <clears throat> yes and no. <laughs> there is a balance. But I often think about, when I, talk, when I talk about this subject, I often think about a pie, a pie chart. You know what a pie chart is, right? So it's our tendency to take our lives and sort of divvy it up into a pie chart. You know, here is, here is one little triangle that represents our family life. Here's another triangle that represents our career. Another big triangle that represents our recreation. Thank you. <clears throat> so frequently we, 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 find, we find ourselves creating a pie, making a pizza of our lives where we have all these different divisions and we say, well, that's reasonable. I'm giving more of that pie and then, of course, don't forget, with that pizza pie, you have a good section there that's to God, to the kingdom of God. And we tend to justify that. But I want to tell you, the whole pie belongs to God. Amen. Every bit of it belongs to God. It's not, I'm not free to say, well, this is for my work. This is for my recreation. This is for my fishing trips. This is for that. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, no, every bit of who I am the entire pie of my life belongs to God. Then, God will allow me areas in my life to devote to things that are necessary. <clears throat> so once my life is fully given over to God, my pizza belongs to God, it's in his hands, then he allows me or he directs me into areas that I can then give attention. And when I, when I function that way, I find myself with much less distractions because God is over every facet of my life. He's got the pizza of my life. You follow me? Yes. So I'm, I'm, I'm sort of plugging a pizza for you today with, with Kevin. How's that? <laughs> Our lives are to be fully given over to God, and the distractions are designed to take us away, and they divide for everything that's important in our lives. What about our families? You would say, well, family is important. They have to represent a good portion of that pie, and that's absolutely true, but... When your pie is fully given over to God, he takes care of your family. 
And Jesus said it this way, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, which really is his purpose for your life, and everything else will be added on to you. Put that first. Put that foremost. In other words, let God and his kingdom and his will for you be that pie complete. And he will take care of you as you go along. And the other things will become not distractive, but relevant from God's point of view. What about recreation? Recreation, guys, even ladies, Recreation is pretty important. We feel like we have to have it, don't we? Why? Because if we don't, we'll go crazy, right? So we, we justify recreation. What are some of the recreations that we might justify? Let's, let's hear it. Football. <laughs> football, all right. I, don't play, I haven't played football in a long time. I used to play soccer. I used to be a goalkeeper until I ran into that goal post. <laughs> so football, I'm, I'm thinking soccer, but you're talking about the wrong, not the wrong ball, the, no, yeah, the egg-shaped yeah, egg -shaped ball. <laughs> <laughs> so football is a great distraction, yes. What else, what else distracts us? What else is a recreational thing? Television. Television. TV, television. Do they still call them TVs anymore? They're much more than televisions, aren't they? So television. Uh, television, what falls in the category of television? Your iPad, your iPhone, your watch. Now you've got, you got iWatches. All of those things fall, fall into that category. Visual entertainment that can easily become visual distractions. I want to tell you that in regards to that, which also includes video games, and the, and the entire span of things that can seriously distract us, we all, we can sum it up by saying TVs. Yes, TVs are extremely distractive, but they're incredibly useful in the hands of a, of a wicked devil. They're, they're incredibly useful. And the devil knows very well how to use these devices. And he's always, he's always hard at work in improving his ways of distracting us using these devices. And he's fine-tuning it, actually, right now. You have TikTok. And, and TikTok is str straightforwardly of the devil. Um, it, all of, these, all of these, these, these television things are there to distract. But do they necessarily have to be evil? No. No, they don't have to be evil. But it takes a consecrated soul to use these things for the glory of God. It takes a consecrated, committed soul to use Facebook Instagram, TikTok, any of these outlets, TV outlets, for the glory of God. Now, the exception is video games. You're not going to play video games for the glory of God. That's just not going to happen. You play video games, you're doing it for your own entertainment, for your own pleasure. And I, I speak out against it a lot, and I'll remind you again that it will impede you. Men, I'm speaking out to men. Ladies, you don't find yourself trapped in video game video game spaces, do you? No, not at all. It's very much a male thing. So let me warn you guys about that, young guys, all of you, men. Stay away from video games. <laughs> and I'm not just saying that as, that as that preacher who doesn't like video games. I was delivered from the hold of video games, and I testified to that before. I was delivered from the hold of video games, and I know how destructive these video games are. So yes, distractions. Now what about, what about uh, our identities, our national identity, for instance, identities, identities in general. So we know that there are many, many things that vie for our attention. What about identity? Identity is one of those things that can really challenge, challenge us for our attention. National identity. For instance, that's a real challenge. And many of us, we justify that strongly. You know, I'm a Republican, I'm a conservative, I'm a liberal, I'm whatever you are, whatever that identity is that you've embraced. And that can really consume you. It can, it can drive you unlike many things can. Because we have this 
deep innate sense of patriotism that we feel as if we're betraying someone if we don't allow our national identity to consume us. But you're not. <laughs> if you've been born again, if you're in the kingdom of God, it is your identity. And it should be it only. Now, do I vote? Yes, I do. I vote. Over the last four years, since, well, three and a half years or so, since 2020, I've become much less political. Much, much less. I used to be more political, and I would justify being political, but something happened in 2020 that turned me around completely. And I am, I'm not saying that I am um, unpolitical or, or ir, ir, what's the word? Apolitical. I'm not saying that I'm apolitical. I will vote. I will have opinions about who I vote for and so on, but I'm not going to allow it to consume me, to overtake me, to, to vie for my attention. My identity has to be God and God only and his kingdom and my job, my responsibility is to guard my soul that I do not allow my soul to be pulled into the place of undue patriotism. And I have every reason to be a patriot American because I immigrated here. I chose to come here to be a good American. I didn't come here because of financial purposes or, 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 or you know, I didn't flee here looking for freedom of religion or any of those things. I came here because I believed that this was the greatest country in the world. I signed up, I became a citizen, I became a Democrat, and I thought I was being a good American citizen and that was important to me. As I was born again, all of, all of that import slowly ebbed away from me. The, the import of, of being a good citizen, vote, all those things slowly drifted away from, from, from who, I, who I became. Because God made it clear to me that that's not who you will be. That's who you are. This is 30 years ago. That's who you are at this time. But what I have for you is way beyond this. And I am, I am on that journey of becoming who he saw me as 30 years ago. Someone who is apolitical, who isn't distracted by local politics or national politics, international politics, not, not this focused at all. And so that's a huge factor that vies for attention. On top of that, we have about a million other things that pulls on you. So what is necessary? What is essential? A full and absolute commitment to God. And that happens as we become sons and daughters of God. You see, many of us, we can enter into sonship and daughterhood. We can enter into sonship with God and never really truly surrender all. And this has been a theme over the last three or four weeks. That you can live a guided life, like I said two weeks ago, but never live a yielded life. Many are called, few are chosen. And that's the factor, and that's the reality. You can live a life where you know that God has put his hand on you, he has called you, and you are, you are being guided by him, but you can also live a life in that place where you are not fully yielded. And we've talked about that before. You want to be called and chosen. Many are called, and only few are chosen. Few are chosen because few will yield themselves fully and surrender all. And become that son of God that we're supposed to be. So the purpose of the message this morning is to point to the benefits of being heirs of God's kingdom. Sons. What are the benefits of being sons and daughters? Keep in mind every time I say sons, I'm not just being, you know, male chauvinistic. Uh, I'm speaking also of sons and daughters. We're going to read from Romans where Paul talks about sonship. Again, he's speaking to all of us. All of us, any one of us who is truly born again has, has come into his kingdom. So let's talk about the factors that are vying for our identity now. We know that there are factors vying for our, for our attention. Our identity now is also up for grabs, right? Many of us, I'm going to say something that's going to tweak some of you. I'm going to get emails, texts, and phone calls. Some of you might just come right up to my face when I when you have the chance to confront me about what I'm about to say. Some of us, we allow our Christian identity to get in the way of our kingdom identity. Is that even possible? 
I want to tell you, it is, it is absolutely impossible. It is absolutely possible that you can allow your Christian identity to interfere with your kingdom of God, son of God identity. I've seen it all the time. I work in this field. <laughs> I work in this field. For 25 years, I worked in the custom door field. I ran custom door companies. And I knew my doors. We, I knew, you can ask Lisa. We'd drive through a neighborhood, and I'd look at that door. I, I know exactly. I, I, yeah, I know what that door is. I can tell you the price of the door, how difficult it is to hang that door. I, I, yes, I knew my doors. I'm out of the door business right now. I work, on a different, I work at a different door. Jesus said, I am the door. That's the door that I work on. And I can recognize so clearly in people the things that impedes them from following after God fully. I can also recognize when a soul is fully committed. My mission is to ensure that the people that God has put in my life to, to minister to, to teach and to preach to would come to that place of full and absolute commitment to God holding back nothing, becoming sons and daughters. And I think you know that's, that's the tenor of my message, right? It always is the tenor of my message. I will never encourage you to live a pizza pie with many divisions. I will never encourage you to divide up your life in terms of relevancy and importance. I will always encourage you to fully yield and fully surrender all of yourself to the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God, his righteousness, and everything else will be added on to you. And that's a message that I need to hear frequently because I have troubles. I have things that are vying for my attention and my identity as well. So let's read what Paul says here in Romans chapter 8. Concerning us being sons and heirs of God, of the kingdom of God. Romans chapter 8, 15 to 17. Is that all I want to read? Now let's go up to 14. 14 to 17, Romans chapter 8. For all that are being led, all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So how many of us here are being led by the Spirit of God? These are the sons of God. Absolutely. So being led by the Spirit, you're sons of God doesn't mean that you're going to follow. You can be led, but not necessarily following. The yielding aspect is very important. For you have not received the spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. So Paul says it here, you're adopted. By the Holy Spirit, your sons. The purpose of his exhortation is to encourage us to act like sons, to behave like sons, and to yield ourselves to God as if we are sons of God, and we are also those that will receive the benefit of being sons. That's, that's the purpose of his exhortation. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. If we are children... Heirs also, heirs of God, and fellow heirs of Christ, of Messiah. If indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. So we need to con concentrate on verse 17. You, you catch what Paul is saying. He, he said, if indeed we suffer with Christ. What is he saying? That you are born again. You, you have the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God, ha the Spirit of God has led you. God is leading you to sonship. If you suffer as Messiah suffered. Now we ought to look at the, the word suffer there. Now when we think of the word suffer in English, what comes to mind? Hardship, difficult, difficult times, you know, the grind. And that's true. But there's, a, there's an aspect of the word suffer in English that also means to allow, to engage, to permit. Right? We, we know that. If you suffer the way Jesus suffered, if you live the way he lived, if you lay down your life the way he did. Jesus said it in Matthew chapter 16. He said it so vividly. And we ought to go over and take a look at what he said in Matthew chapter 16. Concerning the suffering of Jesus, the thing that Paul says that we ought to live 
as he lived. Verse 24 of chapter 16. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to, to come after me, he must. Now that's must, imperative. He must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow after me. We must suffer as he suffered. We must live as he lived. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Those are, those are such profound words that will echo throughout the human community forever. Those words are eternal words. And so Paul makes it very clear that we are sons, adopted by, by God and the, and the Holy Spirit, and the expectation is that we would suffer the way Jesus suffered. We would live the way he lived. Did Jesus live a full committed life to Father God? Yes. He lived a full committed life to Father God. And he made it so vivid for us to see. Jesus had two assignments. I'm not sure if you know this. Two assignments given to him by God. One, to preach the message of the kingdom of God. This is in our Zemat course. His primary function, purpose, was to preach the message of the kingdom of God. He said it at the beginning of his ministry. I did not come but to preach the message of the kingdom of God. And he did that for a solid year and a half or two years. And then he received a secondary word, a second word from God, which was to become the Lamb of God, to go to Jerusalem and be the Lamb of God. So his two words were, one, to preach the message of the kingdom. Second word was to lay his life down for the kingdom. It's no different with us. His calling, his ministry, his words from God are our words from God. His calling is our calling. We ought to preach the message of the kingdom of God. Live it. And that's one way to preach it. You live it. You live a transformed life for everyone to see. You make it clear through your actions, through your life, that you are born again. I am transformed. I am not the same person that I was. And that's why when Jesus received that word to preach the message of the kingdom, what happened just before that was the baptism of the Holy Spirit indicating that he was transformed and that he was then now commissioned to preach the message of the kingdom. And secondarily, he was called to die, to lay down his life for the sake of the kingdom. And that is our call as well, to lay our lives down so that the things of this world are no longer challenging us. We overcome them because we surrender to God. That's how we overcome all of the Distractions and all of the, the vying for our identity. Our identity is rigidly the kingdom of God and his son, his Messiah. Is the church destined to be the wife of Messiah Jesus? Is he going to come and take this wife who is the church? Are you, are you members of that, that, that wife? Yes, then what else can be important to you? A bride that's being prepared for her wedding for at least a year, what consumes her life? All right, so if you have a, a, young, a young betrothed, a bride-to-be, and she knows that in six months there's a wedding, what consumes her for six months? The wedding, preparation, thought, the anguish, and all, the, all of the things that are pointing to this wonderful event in her life. But we are that bride. And we can see that the wedding is near. We ought to live, no matter what period, in, what, what period in, in history we live in, whether it was the 1500s or now, we ought to live our lives as if we're being prepared for this wedding now. Because that's the reality. The believers who lived in the 1500s, they lived and died and they went on to this wonderful wedding. So they had every reason to live their lives in the 1500s as if the wedding was imminent, because it is. The coming of Messiah is always imminent in the life of the believer, because to die is gain, and to be absent from the body is to be present with God. You follow me? So we're all to live our lives with a sense of imminence. He's coming, 
I'm about to meet him in the air. Whether it's now or in the year 503, he's coming. And we ought to live that way, fully committed, fully surrendered to God. So that's, this is what Paul said. Let's read verse 17 again. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God, and fellow heirs of Messiah, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. So if we lay our lives down and we suffer with him, there's a promise that we'll be glorified with him. In the text that we just read, in the context of the text, Paul is basically saying, if you want to be glorified with him, lay your life down. Conversely, if you do not lay your life down, you will not be glorified with him. Is that a fair assessment? Is that a reasonable assessment of what Paul is saying? I know it's not very Christianese. You much prefer to hear a, 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 an absolute secure message where you're absolutely secure in your salvation. You've made a confession of faith. You're a Christian. That's my identity. I'm going to heaven regardless of what. I know you prefer to hear that. I know that's what you want. But that's not what the Bible gives us. The Bible gives us a whole different picture in regards to our eternal destiny. It's by faith that we come into this place. But our faith does not supersede our actions. Our actions has to be focused on the kingdom. We have to yield. We have to live as sons. We have to. Otherwise, we're not sons. You've been appointed to be a son, but you failed to be a son. Many are called and few are chosen. Now, in regards to the rewards of sonship, we'll be glorified. On the day of his coming, on the day of this wedding, we will be glorified. The bride will stand before, his, before, before, before him, before his coming. She will stand and she'll be fully glorified, clean, made white as snow her garments, fully glorified. I'm talking about the resurrection body. That bride that's being prepared for the Son of God is a resurrected bride, glorified, shining in the glory of God. That's a reward, wouldn't you say? The reality that we will resurrect, we will overcome death. Th death will not have any power over us. I said just now that we as a congregation do not celebrate Easter because Easter has nothing to do with the resurrection. In reality, we say it does, we pin it to the resurrection, but in reality it does not. Easter is about fertility. It's about a fertility rite, an ancient fertility rite. It goes all the way back to Babylon. No, that's not resurrection. Resurrection is glorious. Resurrection has nothing to do with fertility, rabbits and eggs and other things. Resurrection is power. Resurrection is the hope of God's kingdom. And a bride made ready for her husband. That's what resurrection is about. It's powerful. It's powerful. And I want to be included. So what do I do? I live as a son, fully committed to the one who brought me into his kingdom. That's what God wants. God wants to be a perfect father and he, in our lives. He's a perfect father, but he wants to be a perfect father in our lives. We have to yield to him. Is it possible, even dads that are here right now, that you can have a son that you absolutely love and you absolutely concern yourself for that son, but he lives in such a way that you're unable to express that love to him? Is that possible? That a son or a daughter can live in such a way that they negate your incredible love for them? Yes, that's true. That's true for us. It's also very true for God. God wants us to live in such a way that he can lavish us with the goodness of, what, of who he is. And all of his blessings as a father he wants to put upon us. But too often we negate it. We obstruct him from doing it. God's wish is that we would live in such a way to glorify him fully. Now, in the age to come, we will also glorify him. In a more literal way, of course, we will also glorify him. So the rewards of the being sons, being heirs, 
are endless. I mean that most literally. The rewards of being a son, a daughter of God, and overcoming in this life, standing before him, are endless. For all eternity, we will live the rewards of what it is to be a son and a daughter and having overcome. One of the things that I've, that I've really, really come to focus on is the reality that this creation needs the sons of God. This creation, this fallen creation, and this creation is fallen, is in desperate need for God's sons. Amen. And I recognize that in me, in my own life. Yes. And of course, Paul spoke about this. We'll go read the verses that are relevant to this reality. But God's creation at this point is languishing, but not without hope. Hope that the sons of God will appear, and we'll read this here shortly, will appear and bring life to this dying planet. You know, as, as humans, male and female, we were appointed in the Garden of Eden, in the original creation, to be stewards, caregivers, caretakers over God's creation. Is that true? Yes, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to take it a step further. We were created to be gods. Yes, small case G, but we were created to be gods, to, to his creation, to represent him. That's entirely biblical. And in fact, Jesus said it. Jesus said that, didn't he? Didn't I tell you that you were gods? Now, having said that, I have to qualify the statement. I'm nothing like God. <laughs> and I certainly don't want anyone to put me in that position. But in regards to my godship, which is tied to my sonship, I am created by God to care for what is his. In other words, what can I liken it to? Someone establishes a business. A strong, strong enterprise. He, he himself owns the company outright. He wants to get the company all set up to where everything will be in order. Every, every person has their, their role and their responsibility. And what is his business? He is, let me think quickly here. He is producing, I, I don't want to say widgets. <laughs> He's producing doors. <laughs> Custom doors. The best. Mahogany, antique, and, and all of them. He's doing, he's doing good work. His purpose is to produce doors that will glorify him. So that in years to come, his company will have this incredible name. And he will be known for the guy that produces the most the most magnificent doors, and that's what he wants to do. What does he do? He brings his son on board. He prepares his son for that position to be his right man, his right hand man, to be right at his side to carry out the business for him. And so he brings his son in, and he says to his son, you have responsibility over every facet of this operation. I give it all to you. Now, I'm also gonna bring in a staff that will come and work alongside you and work with you. And their job would be to carry out your will, which is really my will, because you're doing this for me. And you set them out there and you get them to do what, what, what is my will through you, and you, you accomplish my purpose, which is to produce really good doors. And so he goes out and he hires a crew, uh, 50 men and women, and he positions them to get this company up and running. And within a few short weeks, it's running well. Everyone it has a position, everyone is appointed, and the company is just doing well. Now, the guys, that, the people that were hired to come in, they've been given charge over the, the most important facet of this company, which is to produce good doors. They have, they have a, a, quite a responsible position, but they're doing it on behalf of the son who brought them in, who the father hired. The, fire, the father hired them through him. And now they work under him to carry out this work. Well, the kingdom of God is very much like that. Very much like that. God created man to work under his son. Isn't that true? 
Paul said it in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. For the husband is the head of the wife, and Christ is the head of the husband, and God is the head of Christ. He said that very clearly, denoting there that line of authority that points to the reality that man is to serve, man and wife, is to serve creation. Adam and Eve, appointed by God, under his authority, to serve creation. We were created to be to God's creation who he is to them, to reflect that. You follow me? So back to the door shop. This, 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 this door shop is producing wonderful doors. They're doing a really, really careful job. Lots of mistakes here and there, but they're carrying it out. And their doors are going out in the field, and people are looking at these doors and saying, wow. They're not seeing all the mistakes because guys like me can cover them up real good. And people in the field are saying, wow, these doors are worth every bit of the ridiculous money that I paid for it. Look at this. And they're glorifying God because of the work that we have done. The shop did a wonderful job in producing these doors. And they're glorifying God. He didn't do the work himself. He appointed his son to appoint others to do it. Adam was very much that. So all of creation is under man's authority. We will give an account for what we've done with God's creation. That's absolutely true, and it's absolutely biblical. <laughs> it's biblical. We will give an account for what we've done with God's creation. God is planning to intervene. Yes, he is. How is God going to intervene to bring his creation to a place of fruitfulness? Because creation is not very fruitful, fruitful right now. Not very fruitful. In fact, we're seeing decay. We're seeing a worsening of the creation, the condition of the creation. I was at the beach last week, and I was amazed again to see that with a regular high tide, the ocean was right up on the seawall that was never intended for a seawall. <laughs> it's an amazing thing that's happening. Yes, the sea level is rising, or, the, or, the, or terra firma is sinking, one of the two. It's a sign, it's an indicator that God's creation is under duress. But there's a hope that his son will appear, and who will usher in this, this kingdom that will bring complete repair to God's creation? He will, but who will he come with? His staff. His staff, as it relates to the analogy. Those who were hired, handpicked, called and chosen, right? They fill out applications, they pass their probation period, and they're fully employed, full-time, in the kingdom. These are the ones that will carry out the, the repair work on this planet. And Paul tells us this, and let's go read what Paul says. Back in Romans chapter 8, we're going to read 18 to 20, 27. <clears throat> we'll talk about this as we read it. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be, to be revealed to us. That's a wonderful opening statement that validates what we're saying, what we're looking at this morning. Let's read that again. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. We talked about that glory just now. So we go through this period of suffering. Again, if you suffer, you will be glorified. That's what Paul said. And Jesus illustrated that for us as well. So, suffering brings glory. So, so, Paul begins by reminding us of this. Verse 19. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. So, the creation is anxiously longing something. What is the creation and anxiously longing for? Redemption. It's redemption. It's longing for its redemption. Creation knows that it's set to, 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 to peril. Creation understands that. When I say creation, I mean God's creation. The planet. The planet does not have a conscience. It's not a sentient being. But the planet, the animals, the higher mammals, they know that something is awry. And they know that redemption is needed. 
For the creation was subject to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. So God brought about the effects of the fall. We've got to examine that statement. Adam sinned, and the fall came. The effects of the fall, the curse that came upon Adam, was, 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 was established by God. God understood what had happened to creation at the moment of the fall needed some subjecting. God needed to, needed to subject creation to the process that will ultimately redeem it. And that's what Paul is saying. That the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into freedom of the glory of the children of God. That's powerful. So the creation will be set free from its bondage, from its, from its subjugation by the glory when the children of God come, the glory that we will come in. There is a real connection, and I don't quite understand it, but there's a real connection of being, between the kavod Adonai or the kavod Elohim, the glory of God, and this creation. There's a connection there, powerful connection there somewhere, and Pastor Ken once tried to, to, to delve into that many, many years ago during Zemach, but it's not clear. But there is a real connection between the glory, the Shekinah glory of God, the glory of God, and this creation. Creation responds to his glory. What happened when his glory descended upon Mount Sinai? How did creation respond? In awe of God. An earthquake, fire, rumbling. Yes, there is a connection between the glory of God and creation. So when the church appears completely resurrected, glowing in the glory of God, how many of us will there be that will resurrect and return in the glory of God? Myriads and myriads. How much is a myriad? More than a hundred. I don't know. But millions of us will return fully glorified in the Kavod Yehovah, the Shekinah glory. And that's going to have an effect in God's creation, a good effect. And that's what creation is waiting for, the glory of God. Friends, i got to tell you, for we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. Again, when did creation begin to suffer? From the very moment of the fall. What about childbirth is associated with what we're seeing today? What, what about contractions? You know, you have different types of contractions. You have the false contractions, and you got real contractions. And then you got real, real, real contractions, and you understand how that goes. I've never given birth to a, to a child, but I've witnessed four of them. And the contractions don't get better until it comes to an end. So Paul is relating that to the coming of Christ. Childbirth, birth pains, it's going to get tough. <laughs> there's going to be false contractions. And yes, we've seen a few of those. But then there's going to be real contractions, real heavy contractions. But then comes the end. And this is what Paul is pointing to. But creation groans and suffers for the end of the birth pains. Even the creation understands that there is a joyful time coming. And Jesus said that in John's Gospel. He says, when a woman is in pain to give birth, she is in pain, but then when the child comes, she forgets the pain because a child, a son, has come into the world. Of course, that was a reference to the reality of his coming. And so the world is suffering birth pains, the moan, the, the groan, and the suffering is real. And not only this, but also we ourselves having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for the adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. So we are adopted, but that adoption will not be obvious or will not be ratified until he comes. Isn't that what Paul is pointing to? We, 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 we eagerly await for the adoption of sons, the redemptions of our body. So when is my body going to be redeemed? When will I become convinced that my body is redeemed? When it is? At the resurrection. At the res now, I can, now I can say in faith that, yeah, I, I'm convinced I'm going to resurrect. I will be resurrected by faith. I know it. But faith without my walking it out 
isn't faith. <laughs> isn't necessarily valid, right? So I can stand here now and say to you with absolute confidence and do everything I can to persuade you that I believe it. By faith, I am resurrected. I can do that now. But then five years from now, I'm in horrible sin and I die in it. Am I going to resurrect between God and me? But you understand my point. So you have to live your life yielded to God, overcoming as you live your life in such a way that you will be adopted as sons on the day of his coming. Your body will be redeemed. You will resurrect and you will reign with him. Creation needs it. Creation is dependent on it. For in hope we have been saved. But hope is not seen, excuse me, but hope that is seen is not hope. For, we, for, for who hopes for what he already sees? So again, that's what he's pointing to. He's validating the statement that I just made. But if we hope for what we do not see with perseverance, we wait eagerly for it with perseverance. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. All right, so verse 26 and 27 is pointing to something entirely different. So, to keep it in context, Paul is, Paul is saying effectively that creation, the animals, the trees, the valleys, the atmosphere, everything is awaiting the manifestation of the sons of God who has overcome, who has resurrected, who will reign in God's glory, and creation needs it. Creation was there for us to serve from the very beginning. We've fallen away. We've made a mess of it. God is going to correct it by bringing us back. Those who have overcome in God's glory to serve his creation. There's some, there's some incredible videos on the internet that I've seen about animals, elks, and different animals that would reach out to human beings for help. Have you seen any of those videos? Now, I've seen animals. Lisa and I, we've always had dogs, and, and I've helped dogs, and I've seen where our, our pets will come to us when they're in trouble and they need help. I've seen that before. We have Sarah, who's now blind and deaf, and she's 13 years old, and she's, she's not doing well, but she's there. But when Sarah was younger, she, she suffered a compound fracture. Her, her right, right leg was just dangling like this. It wasn't pretty. And uh, the, the vet saw an opportunity, opportunity to make a quick 10 grand. And so I said, no, I'm not going to give this guy $10,000. If I had it, I wouldn't. Um, so I fixed it myself. I took out some tape, some pieces of wood, and I set her leg, and, I, and she, was, she recovered. Now, the thing about Sarah is, you know, they say that York, York, Yorkies, Yorkshire Terriers, are made of steel. And she's made of steel. Because she allowed me to set that leg in place. I was like this with a chicken bone, like, what did I do with this? Got it back in place, held it real firm, wrapped it up, and she healed. She allowed me to do that. She, the look on her face was like, this hurts. I'm not kidding you. The look on her face when she looked at me as I was doing this, and I had to do it three times because she'd pull it off. Pull the, 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 the this, what I had done, the, uh, the, whatever, the stint, whatever. She would pull it off. I had to do it three times. Two weeks after, I'm still putting it back together. It's terrible. But whenever I would put it back together, she would suffer pain, but she would look at me like, I'm trusting you. She would look at me. That look on her face was like, I don't like this, but I'm trusting you to do this. See, in a, in a very real sense, I was being God to Sarah. I was serving our little pet, Sarah. But there are tremendous videos all over the internet. And you guys, from what I, I picked up just now, you've seen some of them. I saw one yesterday about, about an elk. An elk. But just with a young one with it. So, came out on the side of the road and would not move from the cars that were coming in the direction of the elk. And this is a video. Videos don't lie like that. And if you try to act something out or to, or to 
to set something up like that, it, it never works. You always know when a video is real. And the elk stands there, and there are people with video record with the phone saying, what's going on with this crazy elk? It won't move. And the elk just kept forcing itself on drivers until finally one driver pulled over, and the, the elk is right up in his face. Won't move. The elk had a look on its face, in its eyes, as if, you need to help me. I saw it's the video. You can get the video on the internet. And so this, this guy said there's something wrong. This elk isn't just crazy. This elk needs help. So he gets out of his, his car and follows the elk. The elk leads him to a ditch where there are three other elks buried in mud. The elk literally put itself out in the middle of the road, basically put its life on the line together with this young one, and brought a human being to the help of the other three elks that were dying. And of course, this guy, it's, it's a long video, this guy got some people to help him, and they managed to pull the elks out of the ditch. So what worked in that animal, that elk, that allowed that elk to understand that the humans can help you, you just have to put yourself out there because they love to eat you as well. <laughs> right? The elk knew that. The elk knew that, that, that's, that, that she was a walking steak. She knew it. But she put herself out there for the sake of the other three elks that were about to die. First of all, that's love. That's compassion. That's God's love working in this higher mammal, isn't it? And there are so many, now that everyone has a, has a smartphone, there are so many videos that are being taken out there of these types of events. And they're frequent. Seals in the ocean that are trying to save someone that they believe is drowning. And they won't let that person go until they manage to get the person to a safe place. Uh, porpoises attacking great white sharks. There's a video that came out about three weeks ago of a group of porpoises circling a great white. They had some, some uh, bo people on boards, right? And there was a drone recording what was happening. Some uh, board surfers, what do you call those guys that has to stand up on their boards and uh, whatever, whatever. <clears throat> My days for those things are long ago. And I used to surf many, many years ago. But anyway, there's a, a video of a drone recording what was happening. Two, you got two people on these boards and they were sitting on these boards and a great white pops up. By the way, great whites are coming closer and closer to the shore. I don't know if you know this. New Smyrna, they're, they're spotting multiple great whites. Creation is reacting to its fallen state. Great whites are suddenly wanting to swim with us. Go figure. So this, this video is of this great white, I don't know, 16, 18 foot great white, big shark, comes up alongside the board, the, the, the two borders, and it's swimming between them. Clearly the shark wants to eat. And here comes a pod of dolphins. They just rush right into the shark, began to swim around it and disorient the shark. What did the shark do? Swim away. The dolphins understood what they were doing. Of course, they're higher mammals. The shark has a brain the size of a pea or something like that. So the higher mammals expressed compassion, concern, love, and taken action. And sometimes I wish we would do the same. You know, I don't want to drag this out, but we are fallen creatures. The mammals are not fallen. We are. <laughs> the problem is with us. And don't we behave like fallen creatures compared to the mammals? Don't we? Absolutely. You don't see the mammals behaving the way we do because they're not fallen. We are the knuckleheads that are fallen, and we behave like it. But God is awaiting the time when the sons of God will come and care for his creation. And that's the point. Even the animals know that we have a purpose, which is to care for them. And when necessary, they will turn to us. When necessary. It's as if they know that we're not ready. This is this, I've swam with higher mammals, with, with, uh, with porpoises before. And I've looked into their eyes. And I've seen that gaze into my soul that basically said, you are just pathetic. That's, I've, I've had that before. I've had that experience before. These animals, they know who we are. Sort of instinctively, they know our purpose, 
and our reason for existence, and they also know that we're just not living up to it. They know it because we're fallen. We're just out of our minds fallen. They also know that there comes a time when the sons of God will come. They know it. I am convinced of it. That the sons of God will come and they will bring order. They will bring creation back to what it was supposed to be to begin with. And that's your purpose. That's your function. Many of us, we're looking to be raptured out of here for what purpose? To go to heaven. What are you going to do in heaven? I don't know. I've never thought about it. We just want to be raptured out of here, right? It's about the skin on our backs. There's a purpose for the rapture. And there's a function that comes following the resurrection. We're going to serve God's creation. We're going to uphold God's creation in that state, in that new place, in that kingdom. And that's what it is to be an heir of God's kingdom. To be a son and a daughter. We will resurrect and serve him. Creation will rejoice, brothers and sisters, I want to tell you. All of God's creation will rejoice on the day of his coming because we will resurrect to serve them. We are appointed for that purpose. Many are appointed, but only few will qualify. My goodness, I just touched your Christianity. Only few will qualify. Many are called, few are chosen. Qualifying isn't as difficult as, as I made it sound. Qualifying is quite easy. <laughs> I'm being preyed upon by the people in the back. As soon as they see me make a move, they, camera. <laughs> I really love the attention. You know, I just really love it. I'll be frank with you. I do better without the cameras. People on the internet are saying, what's wrong with them? I do better without the cameras. I've never liked attention. So here we are. We're facing a period in, Christian, in our human history when the change is coming. The change is coming. If we live to see it, praise God. But it's coming. Creation knows it. Creation is... is is, is getting ready for it. Sea levels are rising. Sharks are coming to shore. Strange things are happening. The animals are beginning to look to us. It only means one thing. The kingdom of God is at hand. It's at hand. And we ought to be ready. Yes, I said qualify. Yes, I said qualify. Qualifying is not difficult. Qualifying simply means that you're going to do the Father's will. You're going to hear and obey. He never puts on you more than you can handle. He never puts on you something that's extraordinary and unreasonable. He never does. The things that he gives us are easy. Take my yoke upon you. Take my burden. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. But you've got to be willing to take it. If you're not willing to take it, that easy yoke becomes a hard yoke. If you're not willing, that, that, that burden becomes a heavy burden. But you've got to be willing. You've got to have a willing heart like a, like a good son, a good daughter. That's, 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 that's committed to saying, yes, Papa. Yes, Lord. I will do what you want me to do. And if that's where you are, you're going to qualify. You're going to qualify. Jesus said it in Matthew chapter 7. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy that we do all these things? And he's going to come down to this simple statement. You didn't do the Father's will. You didn't do the Father's will. Now, that's not a very Baptist statement. We much prefer the eternal security thing, like I said just now. But that's just not reality. It's just not reality, and we need to deal with that. The reality is, many are called, few are chosen. And it's not a difficult thing to qualify. By faith, you're in. By faith, you're accepted. By faith, you're justified. Now obey the Father. Carry out his will. And you'll be glorified. You will be glorified on the day of his coming, and creation will rejoice because of you. Isn't that wonderful? 
Creation will rejoice because of you. Rejoice. Even, the, even the great whites will stand on the shore of New Smyrna Beach and will say to the great whites, go, go out into the deep. Go feed on something that you're supposed to feed on. Don't, don't come here. And they'll go. <laughs> they'll say, yes, sir, and they'll go. <laughs> so it's a simple message. I wanted, to encourage, I, wanted, I wanted to encourage you to be sons and daughters, to know that there's a, there's a, a tremendous reward for your sonship, and that you're heirs of God's kingdom. Just as just Paul said it, just as Christ, Jesus, the Son of God, he is the heir of the Father, so are you, in him. Right? In him you are the heir. And sometimes it's difficult to see that in our lives. Our bodies are growing older. We're becoming more feeble. We don't feel very godlike. <laughs> it doesn't get any better. But your ears, your, you are the ones who will inherit the kingdom of God. And never forget that. Walk in it. Walk as if that's, a, that's your reality because it is. It is your reality. Father, we thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be ears, to be sons, fellow ears in your kingdom. And God, we pray that your son will continue to go before us and lead us in the way that we should go, God. We know that your son said, many are called, but few are chosen. God, we ask that you will empower us, enable us to better serve you, to honor you, and to love you, and to overcome. And God, we know that the, the, the one who overcomes will receive a new name. So God, you have prepared a new name for us. And we thank you for this. And God, we bless you this, this, this Sunday morning, this new week. In the name of your son, Jesus, we thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen, amen.